I was trying to work out where to start um, a conversation like this, Richard, because um, I, I guess this year feels overwhelming for all sorts of reasons. Um, and I wonder if, if politically, do you try to explain, to rationalise what is going on this year in the United States? Do I try to rationalise it to me? Yeah, to, to myself? You, to, to make sense um, of it and to try to understand it, I suppose. Um, I guess we all do that to a degree. We kind of, we kind of uh, look at, if, if we look at it for what it is, it's too bizarre and too scary uh, to not try to compartmentalize or rationalize it in some way um, to explain it. But it really, it really is not, uh, you can't really rationalize this uh, in any way. Uh, except to look at it for what it is, which is uh, my country is being, uh, excuse the pun, unmasked um, for who we really are. Um, and this is who we've always really been. And we've managed to cover it up. And we've managed to have in, uh, an incremental uh, change for the better over years with certain eras being better than others, um, you know, the New Deal, and, in the 30s being one of them and the 60s was another and um but we are a severely racist society we are a violent society um and we are a society that promotes the disparity of wealth between um for lack of a better expression the ruling class and the rest of us and so uh, uh that's wh where we are right now and um and uh you know um uh, this experiment of 200 and what is it now, 50 years, uh, has has hit uh, a dead end, um, and um, it might be over. Um, uh, if I was going to be my most pessimistic and realistic self, I would say it's already over, um, and that's what's allowed it to 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 get to the point where it is. You know. Um, I woke up this morning feeling like I had just had um, an affair with a person I hate and forgot that I was happily married. <laughs> That's what this feels like. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's like nothing we'd ever really uh, expected unless you really just looked at who we are <laughs> and um, didn't pretend we were something better. We didn't pretend we were our propaganda. Mm. It's interesting to think about, I suppose, because in a way, m my head immediately goes when you, you know, when you when you say things like that, to perhaps in a way this will be a turning point in that case, and this will be a good thing that in every situation where uh, perhaps those things are true, there needs to be a, a reckoning, doesn't there, and a point of of turning. Well, humans have shown a propensity to not really change at all unless disaster strikes, haven't we? So like um, uh, uh, until climate change reaches the point of, of, of catastrophic um, inevitability, which if you look at it for what it is, is already there. It just hasn't happened. The big iceberg, ha the cities haven't been flooded quite yet. We're getting incremental e examples and evidences of, of that. But until you know, the tidal wave takes out New York, we're not gonna really care. Um, um, uh, and uh, politically, unless until the disaster actually happens, I don't know uh, if, you know, the rumblings are there, uh, all the elements, all the evidence of, of, of political action are there, uh, but we don't know how to do this. You know, it's been a long time since we had a revolution and we've never had a revolution against our own president, you know, and, um, uh, um, it's been a while since we've had a civil war. <laughs> it's been 140 or 50 years. We don't know how to do that yet. Right now, it's the Proud Boys against a bunch of people with bandanas, you know? So um, it's going to, uh, uh, it, and you're right, though. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for um, severe correction as to, as to where we're going and who we are. Um, and I think most Americans would prefer that that than than the alternative. We just we're not used to we're not used to real civil action. Only a few of us partake, 
You know, what are the percentage of the people that are on the streets? Very small. Um, uh, so, you know, we'll see. I, I, this election is going to be violent and it's going and it's going to be chaotic like the like the debate last night um, shows, you know, uh, like President, for lack of a better description, President, oh my God, Trump is, um, is, um, uh, has shown just from the, if he, if you haven't paid attention, he showed it again last night, he's not uh, going to care about this election. He's not going to care about the process. He's not going to respect the process. He's not going to respect the opponent. Um, and he's going to try to steal it um, or just um, uh, take it, however you want to put it, you know. And um, he's been saying this for four and a half years. He's been saying this since before the last election. He said, I will not accept the results of this election in 2016 unless I win. And even then he didn't accept it because he, he, he uh, declared that there was um, fraud and you know, he de delegitimized that. He's stacking the Supreme Court so that if the election goes to the courts, um, he will have his uh, his lackeys um, um, vote in his favor. He's got the Justice Department in his back pocket. Um, uh, you know, and the big question is the military. You know, are is the military going to follow him? Or are they going to follow their oath to the Constitution? Uh, but that's the question with everyone. And so far. <laughs> So far, the results have been shockingly uh, disappointing. And so with, with all of that in mind as well, and with the debate last night, I wonder when, when it comes to Trump v. Biden, um, do you think that, that Biden has done enough or is doing enough to, to really project himself, I suppose, and to, to stand up to Donald Trump? It doesn't matter. It, that, that literally, that, uh, the debate is so stupid. It doesn't matter what he does. Um, those people that want fascism will vote for Trump and those people that want a democracy will vote for Biden and how they express themselves in a, in a mudslinging, uh, re, you know, naked wrestling match. Uh, who cares? You know, uh, is Biden the best debater in the world? No, he's never been. He's, you know, he's a childhood stutterer who has some problems when he, when he's under pressure in those circumstances. He, communicates beautifully when uh, when he's speaking um, in other in other settings and in other circumstances so I'm not worried about that um, uh, but how they do against each other who cares uh, you know it, it just doesn't matter everyone who has already decided has decided and the 11 people in America who haven't decided you know the hell with them um, it, the question is whether we're going to count the votes or not that's the question. The question is, are people going to get to the ballots, uh, the ballot box without getting beaten? Um, will the mail-in votes uh, be counted or delegitimized by Trump, which is what he's trying to do? And that's what he, that's, well, that's what all of last night was about. Um, Trump saying, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I don't uh, uh, validate the election. I don't give it credence. It, I'm going to lose. And therefore, it doesn't count. Yeah. Um, and he's, you know, what did he say to the Proud Boys? Stand by? Yeah, he's stand kidding. by. Yeah, stand by. And yeah, uh, it was, it's been picked up, hasn't it, as a bit of a, perhaps a call to action. And it, feel, it felt very uncomfortable. It felt very incongruous, I think, to, you know, to that sort of, it was almost done as a throwaway line as well, wasn't it? It was kind of just off to the side a little bit, just as a bit of a... Well, because he was he was challenged and backed him into a corner, and that's the best he could do to kind of yield in that situation is to not say stand down and to not um, discredit them, um, but to say uh, just stand by. He's been messaging um, his kind of private army for four for four or five years now. You know, and that's what Charlottesville is all about. What there are good people on both sides was all about. You know, he's he's winking at the white supremacists to take up arms and to take to the streets. That's what he's doing. That's what he's been doing. And that's how he thinks he's going to stave off losing an election by six to 10 points, which is what's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, I suppose with all of this in mind then, this brings me on to chatting about the West Wing. Uh, we're looking for reasons for optimism, for reasons to be cheerful. Does the, does the West Wing coming back in October 
bring us reasons to be hopeful and optimistic? It's such a beautiful episode that we decided to to um, to stage. I think we, we, you could describe it as a staged reading, and it's the Hartsfield Landing, which is uh, really an episode about voting and um, and 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 how beautiful the the act of participating in a democracy is all about. And it, but it's also about telling the president, our president Bartlett. Um, to be himself, to not be afraid to be brilliant, to not be afraid to be smart, um, uh, to not try to downgrade his persona so that plain folks will will accept him. This was a, an answer really to George W. Bush back in the day. And, um, uh, and Aaron Sorkin believes in smart. You know, he believes that People that are um, um, uh, uh, prepared and educated and studied uh, to be in a position of leadership should lead with their intelligence and with their heart and with their brilliance um, and not pretend otherwise. So it, it really brought me to tears to even just read it again. And it didn't at the time, because at the time it was an another West Wing episode about how, how, how nice democracy could be. But now it's got, got great poignance because the democracy may be over. And, um, and this is our last chance possibly to save it. And, and so the episode is, is quite poignant for that reason and beautiful. And it was so great to be with uh, my fellow West Wingers and to do these scenes with Martin Sheen again. And, um, uh, and to be with Tommy Schlamys, our you know our great director, and Aaron being around the set and walking around and humphing and <laughs> and doing what he does because he can't write anymore. He's already written, so he can't write anymore. So his his behavior is quite fun to be around. And um, just see everybody, Allison and 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 Brad and and uh, Dulé and everybody. It was just uh, just a thrill. And, even in the pandemic, even with masks on, it was just a thrill. Yeah, I remember one uh, one line from the West Wing that I often quote actually uh, in my own life, um, and it was President Bartlett who said it. Who said, uh, "Our job is not to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Our job is to raise it." Um, and I don't know that always has stuck with me actually, just uh, as a kind of um, mm. a principle to live by, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, look, if if uh, what would have happened had. Uh, Aaron Sorkin written, say, the Biden side of last night's debate. You know, um, he would have he would have embraced the attack on the left, and he would have said, um, um, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders is a good man, and the idea of a green um, uh, uh, a new Green Deal is a good one. I have some adjustments, but the idea of saving our planet is a good one. The idea of providing health care for everyone is a good one. You know, he, he wouldn't have backed off and he wouldn't have sidestepped um, some of the attacks. He would have embraced uh, um, uh, the value of caring about people, you know. Um, uh, Sorkin's special. He's a special, he's a special writer and he's, um, uh, and uh, well, we need him. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think um, do you think there's any concern that bringing President Bartlett back, who for decades now has been uh, such a figure of hope and optimism and, you know, what a president perhaps should be uh, in the view of, of West Wing fans and Bartlett fans? Do you think bringing him back uh, makes voters look and go, mm, we don't have that. We don't have that in either candidate in the 2020 election. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <clears throat> um, because the alternative is pretty, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty clear. Um, and Biden has a lot of qualities that I think are Bartlett related, you know, and just in terms of the way that he cares about humanity, he cares about people, he might not express it um, as, as beautifully as if he was given a, a, a monologue by Aaron Sorkin, but um, he's, he's Catholic, the way that Bartlett was, um, and he's a the good kind of Catholic, if you ask me, is that he's the kind of Catholic that believes in service, believes in taking care of of, uh, of each other and humanity as a whole, who 
has great compassion for people. <clears throat> um, so there is, there are some qualities that are there. And, um, uh, you know, I don't think uh, the West Wing is a depiction of anything real. Obama, I suppose, came close in the way that he articulated himself. But um, <clears throat> uh, the realities of the real world are, are, are truly um, uh, scary. Uh, as to what, how, and it makes uh, leaders compromise. You know, the the real the real nature of America was much more captured by Breaking Bad. Uh, Breaking Bad is what America is. Breaking Bad is is a man trying to take care of his family who has a catastrophic illness, who is who is resigned and resolved to do anything he can do in order to achieve um, uh, uh, a security for his family. That's America. And crime and, and, and murder and, uh, and filling uh, each other with damaging substances uh, are secondary to how do we negotiate taking care of ourselves in this mess. Breaking Bad is really the, the much more uh, portrait of who we are than the West Wing. That's, that's an interesting thought. Never thought of it like that at all before. Uh, but that, that is interesting. Um, one other sort of uh, thought where my brain went just thinking about this was, you know, we know the president. We know President Trump watches an awful lot of television. Uh, we're aware of that. Um, what would you what do you think he would uh, he's going to how would he react? Uh, was he to catch the uh, the West Wing special in the middle of October? What do you think he'd have to say about it? He won't. He'd fall asleep watching it. I am. I, um... I just don't care what he thinks. I okay. just do not give a flying blank. I just don't care. I've, I grew up in New York City, been around this buffoon my whole life. He was dismissed by most of us 40 years ago. He's a business failure. He's been bankrupt a thousand times. He's responsible for real estate in New York becoming too expensive for New Yorkers to live in it. There's nothing about this man that's interesting other than to watch his demise. I, I just don't care what he thinks. I just could not care less. Oh, fair enough. Um, as a West Wing fan as well, I do want to just uh, sort of think, uh, go back to what, it's, what it was like being on set. What was the kind of mood among the cast, I suppose, <laughs> given it's, you know, it's such a lovely experience, I'm sure, for all of you to be back together. Uh, but, you know, picking up on some of the stuff you're saying there, it's, it's a difficult time. And it's a, it's, a, it's a time that weighs heavily, I imagine, on, on you and on the cast as a whole. So I don't know, were you all kind of looking to pick each other up and support each other? What was it like on set? Well, uh, there's such a great friendship that we have and, and com camaraderie and love for each other that the minute um, I see these faces, my, my spirit is lifted. And um, I think that's true of all of us. It's, it's just like, uh, it's like time hasn't passed at all, mm -hmm. except, um, you know, Dulé has gray hair in his beard <laughs> and that's weird to see. Um, he was just a kid back then. Um, the rest of us are just, you know, bending over and getting grayer. But, um, <clears throat> but other than that, you know, we have, we have this, the same people, you know, I mean, um, uh, you know, uh, we just adore each other and, and, um, uh, and then to work together again, to do that, which, which became such a, such a, a lovely track to get on uh, with each other um, uh, was just divine. It was just a pleasure. Um, so no, we didn't have any special extra um, uh, uh, heavy lifting in order to get ourselves up. I, it just happens when we see each other. We, we've seen each other many times for political reasons. We campaigned together in, in 16. We do PSA, public service announcements. And <clears throat> every now and then we actually see each other socially. Um, uh, and uh, you know, it's just a great affection that we have for each other. It's yeah, just lovely. That. That is lovely, absolutely lovely. Uh, as a as a kind of you know edging towards a conclusion, I suppose that the focus of the episode is about voting. Uh, you know, as you say, it's about trying to encourage voting and encourage that democratic process. Do you think, um, you know, we, we chat about the debates perhaps only appealing to the people that have already made up their minds and and the kind of what what element what um, 
uh, what weight does that does these these sort of event actually have in in swaying opinion and in 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 helping people decide? Um, is this episode designed to to try to help undecided voters? Where does it kind of place itself to the, the episode? In terms of, yeah, in terms of appealing to the electorate, what's it trying to do? I think the I think the event is just trying to encourage people to overcome whatever obstacles are put in front of them in order to vote, and that's it. Um, uh, it was written you know, 20, 17 years ago. So it's not designed to, uh, you know, it's, it, we're rebooting a, an episode that's already been aired. Mm. <clears throat> and it's the episode that, as I said, kind of celebrates the voting process and, um, uh, and celebrates our, our, our entire process. And, um, no, the event is, it's when we all vote is, uh, is, uh, run by um, run by uh, Michelle Obama, <clears throat> and uh, it's designed to stop um, uh, to 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 overcome obstacles. That's it. so. If people are are uh, having trouble mailing in their vote, they have they have um, alternatives to to find out how to help themselves um, get to the ballot and get their ballot to the to be counted. Um, if there are obstacles um, in their precincts, then uh, they have uh, an option to to get help. So I've personally witnessed a whole lot of um, uh, obstruction in North Carolina in 2016 on Saturday before the Tuesday of Election Day when there was early voting. And <clears throat> saw hundreds of people turned away. <laughs> Um, because they closed the poll at, at noon and um, decided that people didn't uh, 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 abide by the rules by getting there at a certain hour. Hundreds and hundreds of people who came earlier and saw the line was too long tried to come later and were turned away. So <clears throat> that's the kind of thing that, that um, <clears throat> if people need help, that this, this organization um, uh, will give them access to that help. But I don't think it's going to change anybody's mind. It might inspire the indifferent um, to get up off their ass and go to the, the booth or go or go um, find their their mailbox <clears throat> and get their ballot, uh, and that can make a difference. You know, so you know, a couple of thousand. But look, if if this election was counted fairly um, and <clears throat> proceeded fairly. Uh, Biden would it would be a landslide. It would be an unprecedented landslide. I have no doubt about that. But so it was 2016. I was on a call with a Republican pollster at five o'clock in the afternoon on election day, who said that based on his data, um, Clinton had won by six to seven points, wow. and that Wisconsin and Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania were not even in play. <clears throat> and his data was all wrong? I don't think so. That had never happened before. His data was always right before that. So it's, there's something going on in this country. And in 2000, uh, the Republicans learned they can steal an election. And in 2016, I think that they did. And in 2020, they're going to go all out to do it again uh, on a bigger scale. Um, so we have to figure out a way to get people to 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 everyone who has inclined to vote, to vote, and to uh, get all their votes counted and make sure they don't get hurt in the process. Richard, thank you very much. Uh, it's really lovely to speak to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's nice to see you again. And, yeah, you um, too. Uh, and I'd love to at some point uh, get caught up on what's happening over there because I'm sure you're in just as much of a, of a uh, dire state's in some ways as we are yeah um but uh please give my regards to everybody over there and and i hope things work out for you as, well, as i hope they do here thank you very much and yeah likewise i mean uh 